It's Ken Harbaugh with Against All Enemies. For today's episode, I want to share part of an interview with Miles Taylor, who was one of the few people to have seen the cruelty and callousness of Trump's White House from the inside as a senior official in the Department of Homeland Security, and then speak up about it. His second book, Blowback, just came out, and it is a powerful warning about what a second Trump term would mean for the country. You can catch our full interview on Burn the Boats, but here on Against All Enemies, I wanted to focus on the risks that people like Miles take when they stand up to right-wing extremists. Here's just a sampling of the kinds of voicemails that Miles gets on a regular basis simply for telling the truth about Donald Trump. Believe it or not, I have edited this heavily to take out the most violent and depraved threats. What's left will still shock you. What you're doing to President Trump is disgusting. You're disgusting people. You're evil and you're going to go down. You are a traitor. You're pushing for anti-Trump? We're going to dox you. You're not going to be able to walk down the street. You're an anti-American. Leave the country. You're not welcome here anymore. You're anti-American. You hate your country. Get out. Because you will deserve the, the wrath of hell. Um, and I think you will get what's coming to you. God willing. You guys poke the bear. You woke the sleeping giant. We're coming, my man. We started Against All Enemies because of the clear and present danger posed by domestic extremists. I worry, though, that when we think about extremism, we sometimes picture shadowy fringe groups operating on the margins of our society. That's absolutely a thing, and my co-host Chris Goldsmith exposes these groups and their members like no one else does. But what is uniquely dangerous about the moment we're currently living in is not the presence of groups with violent anti-democratic agendas. We've actually always had those in this country. What's most frightening is the fact that expressions of violence have become normalized. The celebration of fascist behavior has become mainstreamed. If you've been watching Against All Enemies, you know that. We showed you video from a Moms for Liberty convention where the speaker doubled down on quoting Hitler approvingly and the crowd went crazy. This kind of behavior is incompatible with a diverse democratic society. It's why we are pushing back. Miles and I get into that in this excerpt from our conversation. We cover a lot more ground in the full interview on Burn the Boats, so please check that out as well. Thanks, everyone. Here's me and Miles. The thought that 80 million Americans or 70 million plus Americans voted for Trump uh, the last time around is, is terrifying. And even the, the positive results in the last midterms, I don't think inspire a, a whole lot of confidence, still far too close for comfort. And you wrote this about Trumpism. We didn't snuff it out. Rather, we looked the other way as cinders lit the dry underbrush of our fraying society and spread like wildfire. Right now, the winds favor the fanatics from a historically divided electorate to grim public attitudes about political violence. And that's what really scares me the most, this rhetoric, and not just rhetoric, but the activities of extremist organization fomenting, carrying out acts of political violence. Uh, we're, we're approaching very dangerous times reminiscent of the, the late 1850s. Yeah, this is the type of thing that, you know, Ken, I always say this, if you told me 10 years ago, I was going to be talking about the prospect of a new American Civil War, I would have said, you know, Miles hit his head one too many times, you know, what's wrong with that guy. But a lot of the folks that I spoke to for this book were using that type of language. You know, I'll, I'll go back to Fiona Hill, who I mentioned earlier, who'd been a Trump advisor for much of the administration. Fiona used a term called soft secession. Her warning was that if Trump or a savvier successor won the White House, you would see the start of soft secession movements in the United States. In other words, red states and blue states increasing, increasingly separating themselves from the legal architecture that undergirds our democracy. Uh, and in and, and her view, when you go and study foreign civil wars and civil strife, 
that's usually the first indicator you see before something moves into more violent conflict is this period of soft secession. Her comment was, we're actually in it right now. But there was another Trump official who in these conversations said to me that he predicted uh, if Trump won, that there would be at least legal civil war in this country, if not actual violence. And his comment was, you know, it's not going to be battalions, you know, on in open fields. It's going to be a different type of civil war, one that includes low level violence, political assassinations uh, and, and civil strife in major U.S. cities. And that political assassination piece is the one that really worried me. You see this a lot. Uh, when you look back at history, that moments where a major leader is attacked or, God forbid, killed can spark uh, more widespread violence and light the dry underbrush of dissatisfaction in the political system. And right now, we're seeing the warning signs basically blinking red as much as they've been since 9-11 on that front. So you know, law enforcement officials told me they're seeing more chatter about threats to public servants than at any point since 9-11. We saw a tenfold increase in threats to elected leaders from the beginning of the Trump administration till the end of the Trump administration. But more fundamentally, Ken, Americans' attitudes towards political violence have surged in a favorable way. Uh, I think NPR found that 25 percent of Americans have a favorable view of violence towards the government in certain circumstances, which was a high watermark. And then there was the famous University of Chicago survey last year that found one in 10 Americans believed Donald Trump should be forcibly reinstalled in the White House. I don't care what your political stripes are. You have to look at that data uh, dispassionately and say that that really is dry underbrush that's ready to be lit on fire in the wrong circumstances. You use the phrase, and everyone uses it, red states and blue states, and that always makes me nervous when we are talking about civil war because it it presumes the kind of possibility of a clean break that we saw in the 1860s that just can't happen this time it's it's a liberal conceit you often hear that oh we'll just write off the red states you know texas can go its own way we'll see how they do without federal dollars I think we need to dispense with that because there are good people in Texas fighting for progress uh, and we're not going to have a clean break. Um, it's it's just not possible. And I know you don't believe that either because you, you introduce some really helpful framing like the digital Mason-Dixon line. Can you talk about these fractures in, in a modern society, an integrated society like we have today? Yeah, it, well, I, and I think a lot of Americans feel this viscerally because it's become so much more personal. I mean, it used to be that political conflicts were a thing that you could turn off on the news. But now, for really the first time in modern history, Americans feel concerned about their own neighbors and are unwilling to go to bonfires and picnics where they're worried they'll run into someone of another political persuasion. I mean, I think we've all probably been guilty of it. We've all said it to a friend or a family member like, oh, man, you know, those are MAGA people. We're not going to hang out with them or the opposite. You know, folks on that side of the aisle saying, you know, we're not going to hang out with those crazy libs. We're becoming much more divided at the household level. Uh, and some of that also is shown in the data. I mean, if you look at political polarization in the United States, it's not so much about red states and blue states anymore. It's about zip codes. Yes. And there's really shocking data that shows red zip codes are getting redder and redder and blue ones bluer and bluer. So you have these little pockets right next to each other all over the United States where people are self-selecting into communities based on their political beliefs. And, and, and this is the highest rate we've ever seen it since polling began in that space. So the phenomenon is really hyper-localized. Um, and, and that gets to some of the solutions here are not short-term solutions. They're long-term fixes. And you know, I think this is another thing that people sense in their gut, and the data also backs up. And that is, you can say roughly that 10% of the ideological extremes in the United States are making the decisions for the other 90% of us. And that's roughly validated when you go look at the fact that right now, uh, you know, only 20% of Americans approve of the job Congress is doing. Really, really, really low. But Congress has a 95% re-election rate. In other words, the average member of Congress overwhelmingly wins re-election when they run. So how can Americans have such a low view of Congress, but the majority get re-elected? 
And the reason is because most of those decisions about who wins races happen in the primaries. And in most states, you're not allowed to vote in the primaries unless you're a registered member of that party, which means the ideological extremes go out pick the candidates in the primaries, and then the rest of us are left in the general election with people who are too extreme and we have to pick the worst of two evils. That simple defect right now in our system has resulted in an increasingly polarized electorate and an increasingly polarized society. But the only way to fix that are long-term structural democracy reforms, and that will take decades.